The concept of God's unconditional love is central to many faiths. It emphasizes that God's love for his children is unwavering and boundless, extending to everyone regardless of their background or past actions. This love is not earned through good deeds or merit, but is freely given by God's grace. The Father of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our beloved fathers, deacons, monks and nuns, our beautiful and beloved congregation, those who are with us here in the church and those who are watching us through live streaming, may the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you and protect you all the days of your life. Amen. Amen. That's the way. The gospel of today in this holy mass service and this liturgical service is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, from chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, inclusive. Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, inclusive. The Lord Jesus is giving us another parable where he talks about the certain man had a vineyard. And he went out five times seeking laborers for his vineyard. He went out early in the morning and found some people idle in the marketplace. And he said, why are you standing here doing nothing? They said, well, Lord, nobody hired us. He said, okay, go and work in my vineyard and I will give you a denarii. They said, okay, Lord. So they went, and then the Holy Bible says he went out on the third hour. And so again, some people standing idle asked him the same thing. They said, nobody hired us. He said, go and work in my vineyard. But he did not make a deal with them on to how much he will pay them. Only those in the early morning, he made a deal that he'll give him a denarii. So the third hour people went working without discussing the wage. And then he went out the third time and he says he went out on the sixth and the ninth hour. The Holy Bible puts these two hours together. Early morning separate, three, third hour separate. But when it came to the sixth and the ninth hour, they were put together. He went out on the sixth and the ninth hour. And he did the same, sent some more people to work in his vineyard without dealing with them on how much he, would, he should pay them. And then he went out on the 11th hour where there was only one hour remaining in that day. And he sent them and they worked for that last hour. At the end of the day, he calls his steward and he says, go and call the laborers and start paying them from the last, beginning from the last and ending with the first. So the last people who worked in the 11th hour, and by the way, these hours till today are the hours of prayers for our beloved Jewish people. They still use those hours. Early morning, 6 a.m., Third hour, 9 a.m. Sixth hour, 12 noon. Thir um, ninth hour, 3 p.m. Eleventh hour, 5 p.m. I'll repeat it again. Early morning, 6 a.m. The day begins at 6, ends at 6. So early morning, 6 a.m. Third hour, 9 a.m. Sixth hour, 12 noon. Ninth hour, 3 p.m. Eleventh hour, 5 p.m. The day finishes at 6 p.m. So the people of the 11th hour who started working at 5 p.m., they finished their shift at 6 p.m. They only worked one hour. When they came first, they received a denarii. The early morning people, 6 a.m., how long did they work? 12-hour shift. They said, yes, sir, we hit the jackpot today. If those people who worked for an hour received a denarii, well, guess what? 
we work 12 hours and there is extra overtime in here. It's time and a half and maybe it's double. So there goes Centrelink. When the, first, when the early morning people saw the 11th hour receiving a denarii for one hour worth of work, they said, we will receive much more. To their shocking surprise, they got paid a denarii as well. They started whinging and complaining and saying to the owner of the vineyard, this is not fair. The Lord called one of them. He said, my friend, didn't we make a deal together? And I said, I'll pay you a denarii and all of you accepted and agreed. Then what is your problem? I, am I not fair with you? Have I done you any wrong? No, we made a deal that I will pay you a denarii. All of you agreed and went working accordingly. So what is your issue now? Aren't I the rightful owner of my vineyard and the laborers? Then I have the right to do as I please with my laborers. Why are you upset and angry with me? Is it because I am the holy one and you are the wicked one? Why are you complaining and it's not fair for the last hour to receive the same wage as the one who worked all day long, 12 long hours. Oh my goodness. The human nature or the fallen, corrupt human nature is so difficult to be taught. Even God struggles with us. Not that he cannot fix us. It's very easy for him to fix us. Believe you me, he can break anyone, anytime, before they blink their eyes. He can bring us to the ground before we blink our eyes. But the only thing that makes God struggle with us is that love, is that love. God says to every single one of us, now the vineyard owner is Jesus Christ. The vineyard, that is the Old Testament church. So just like he, deal, he dealt with the Old Testament church, he will deal the same way with the New Testament church. He is the same God. Whatever he did with the old, he will do with the new if we do not repent. What happened to the temple? Gone. What happened to the people who went against him? Gone. He will do the same thing with the New Testament church if the church leaders and the workers in the house of the Lord, the Lord do as they please, not as the owner, the rightful owner pleases. He will deal with them the same way he dealt with the Old Testament church. It is that love that makes God struggle with us. If it wasn't for love, you would have seen a, an extremely awesome God. Oh man, no human, no human being could have ever even dreamt of doing something and getting away with it if it wasn't for his love but with God there is everything placed in perfection just like the Holy Bible the book of Ecclesiastes says there is a time for everything under the Sun God works in perfect timing and when his time comes, I can assure you, 
Nobody escapes neither his reward nor his punishment. Nobody. You would have probably have done something good in your life and had forgotten about it. God never forgets. When the right time comes, he will reward you and he will remind you of what you've done good. But he will also pay you back for whatever evil you've done and he will definitely remind you of it. No one escapes God's payment or reward. No one. But you see, look at the human race. The Lord Jesus went out seeking people for his kingdom. Whenever you read the Holy Bible, always look before and after to understand what this particular passage is all about. Some people, unfortunately, they read one verse and base their belief and understanding on that verse alone. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. So when we read chapter 17, 18, 19, and today's Gospel 20, we'll understand what 20 is all about. Chapter 17, according to Saint Matthew, the Lord Jesus is establishing his kingdom which is taking three of his disciples on the top of Mount Tabor where the Lord transfigures what we call the Feast of Transfiguration. What is the Feast of Transfiguration? The Lord Jesus establishing his kingdom. Chapter 19, the Lord Jesus calling people to his kingdom. What is a kingdom? It's a country, it's a place. When you establish a country, when you establish a place, what do you do next? You bring people and fill that place with people. Let them inhabit it, live in it, reside in it. When you bring people, what do you do after that? You teach them on how to live in that kingdom. Chapter 17, establishing the kingdom. Chapter 19, calling people to the kingdom. Chapter 18, the way, the living of the kingdom, or the way you live in the kingdom. And what is chapter 18? Unless you come back and be like a little kid, a little child, you cannot live in the kingdom of heaven. So the way to live in the kingdom of heaven, all of us need to come back and be like a little child. Now once you establish it, then you call people to it, then you teach people on how to live in it, next is payment. They started working. So what do you do? You start paying them. So chapter 20, I'm paying you guys. Now, who established the kingdom? Jesus Christ. Who called the people to the kingdom? Jesus Christ. Who taught the people on how to live in the kingdom? Jesus Christ. Who pays them? Jesus Christ. Why do we get upset? See, from the early morning till the last hour of the day, all of them were unemployed. And there was no Centrelink payment either. We tend to bludge sometimes in this country. Couple of days cash money, I work, and the rest from good old Social Security Centrelink baby. Used to be called Social Security. They changed it to Centrelink. Nice titles. They don't work that well. But there was no payment at all. They were unemployed. Now, people standing idle doing nothing in the biblical terminology, meaning they were living in sin. You see, when you live in sin, you are unemployed because sin makes you unemployed bankrupt. You have nothing. You are unable to work because sin paralyzes the human being. Just like in the literal sense, when somebody becomes paralytic, 
far from all of you. And I pray for the healing of everyone who is sick. In Jesus' mighty name. But sin makes us spiritually paralytic. We cannot work, we cannot go, we cannot come. We become idle. We stand still. Spiritually before God, we are bankrupt, we are dead. The Lord, out of love and mercy and compassion, he went out searching for the lost sheep. He went out searching for the human race that has fallen so deep in sin and transgressed against the almighty God and his laws. So he goes out early morning. Early morning is the beginning of the day. What is the beginning of the day? Adam. Early morning people is Adam. The beginning of the human race. That's where it all began. Adam transgressed against God in the Garden of Eden. The very beginning to everything that followed later. He went out early morning and saw Adam living in sin. Adam, Adam, where are you? He said, Lord, I am hiding behind a tree. Why, Adam? Because I and the good old Eve are naked. Who told you you are naked? Oh, you ate from the forbidden tree, didn't you, Adam? I warned you not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You ate from it, you realize now you're naked. You were naked from the very start. How come you did not realize your nakedness? Because I was living in the holiness of God. When you live in holiness, you are no longer ashamed of nothing because holiness becomes your cover. The moment you walk away from God, the, the outfit of holiness, the dress of holiness falls from you. What do you see? You see nothing but your nakedness, i.e. your sins, your wrongdoings, your foolishnesses, your inequities. You see yourself in a very, very ugly picture. Ugly. And you say to yourself, this is not me. This is not me. Because the picture, the image, has changed. This is not who I know who happens to be. So I went out early morning, Adam, standing idle, fallen in sin. Go and work and I'll give you a denarii. He went out on the third hour, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Moses. The time of Moses. The Israelite nation led by Moses out of the bondage of Pharaoh and Egypt. Egypt represents symbolically the pleasures and the treasures of the world. He is not talking about Egypt the literal country in Africa. No, Egypt here represents the treasures and the pleasures of the world. Egypt can be your King's Cross. Egypt can be your Star City Casino. Egypt can be your Las Vegas. Egypt can be your Wa'a Wa'a Dov Dov. Egypt can be those little dark alleys. And in recent days, Egypt has become Istanbul. With all the plastic surgeries. How could I let go of the pleasures and the treasures of the world and you want me to go into the wilderness and leave the river Nile and the lush green land surrounding the river Nile? I need to be an idiot to do that. God said, I want you to be an idiot. Leave the world for as long as you stay in the world. You may think you're smart, but you become a slave to your own intellectual understanding 
and to Satan, who is Pharaoh. I went out at the third hour, 9 a.m., Moses and the Israelite nation, whom I called my firstborn son, whom I gave my laws, my prophets, and I waited, and I waited, and I gave them everything they needed. My vineyard, I cleansed it, I looked after it, and I waited for the grapes, but it was absolutely barren because they broke my word for 40 years. They gave me nothing but agony and pain. I brought them to be people of God. I brought them out of slavery into freedom, out of bondage into the sons of God, from the slave enslavement of Satan to the freedom of the Heavenly Father. Yet they chose Egypt and Pharaoh over this loving good God. Aren't we the same? The Lord calls you my child and says, I am waiting 24-7, 365 days a year. My arms are stretched wide open. My heart is crying out to you, saying, come back, repent and come back. You're still choosing the bosom of Satan over the bosom of your heavenly father. You are choosing to go to darkness and rejecting to come to the light of the world, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But I'm still willing to employ you. I'm still willing to allow you to work in my vineyard. I'm still allowing you to work in my church in my kingdom. Early morning, Adam, third hour, 9 a.m., Moses, and then look at this, and the sixth and the ninth hour put together. Now why you need to understand how the Holy Bible talks. Why the sixth and the ninth hour were put together? Sixth hour, 12 noon. And then the ninth hour, 3 p.m. What happened from 12 noon to 3 p.m.? Jesus Christ of Nazareth was crucified at 12 noon, died in the flesh at 3 p.m. So the sixth and the ninth hour is 12 noon and 3 p.m. It is the time of Jesus. You see, Adam came failed. Moses came, failed, the son, the inheritor, the begotten and the beloved of the father had to come because there is no salvation but in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So when Jesus came, he came when? At the sixth and the ninth hour, 12 noon and 3 p.m. He was nailed on the cross in order for you and I to be employed once again. We were unemployed. What made us to work again? The blood and the death of Christ in the flesh on the cross. That's what brought us back into life again and being employed once again. The 11th hour. Uh, Five p.m. One hour for the day to be over. The Jewish people, they'll come back to Christ in His second coming. It'll be the last hour, the great tribulation. That's the last hour. Those who rejected Him in the first coming will beg for mercy in the second coming. They will come back to Christ. Even those who are Freemason today. <laughs> Let me tell you one thing. If 
somebody comes to you and says Freemason is a business opportunity and they allow you to practice your religion freely, they got nothing to do with your religion, brother. You want to be a Christian, go ahead. In fact, they use the Bible. You want to be a Muslim, stay as you are. You want to be a Buddhist, as you are. A Hindu, as you are. An atheist, we don't care what your religion. This is an business opportunity. We allow you to meet people, mix with people, mingle with them, exchange business cards, and business opportunities will make you flourish. That is at the surface level. But when you get to the third, 33rd, <laughs> after 30, 31, 32, 33, and there is beyond, by the way. The 33rd ring is given to people, but there are people beyond the 33rd ring. Now those worship Satan. Their God is Satan. I know. It's sad. For any human being to deny the existence of the true divine God. Very sad. Very sad. Believe you me, I pray for everyone. Even if you have seen me sometimes angry, upset, screaming on top of my voice and telling shame on you. That doesn't mean I don't love you. But it is sad. Sometimes love is very loud. Sometimes love can scream. Sometimes love can hurt. Sometimes love can punish. But it is love. Parents get angry at their children. It is not out of hatred. It is out of love. Parents sometimes discipline them by smacking them on the nappies. Well, now in the free world, they say, little kid, call triple zero. Put your mom and dad in the cage. Take them to Fairfield Police Station. Listen, mate, I'm Middle Eastern. I teach my child my way, brother. Until today, until today, in our pilgrimage to Israel, we went and visited some Palestinian people there. Christian people, not terrorist. Christian people, faithful people, God-fearing people. We are Christian. We are the people of love and peace. For our Lord, our teacher, our master, always taught us to love everyone, to pray for everyone, and to be in peace with everyone. This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You will never, you will never see someone who has Christ, the true Christ in their heart, to go and kill and blow themselves and others with them. Impossible. For if you have the true Christ, you will only do one thing. You will sacrifice your life for the comfort of others. For Jesus is the only true teacher that teaches you on how to live true divine love. Middle Eastern people, when you go into a family, they have children, they will never come out because they've been taught when a visitor comes, you go inside your room. It is a shame for a little child to come running, jumping everywhere and taking whatever. When there are visitors here, you need to be well behaved and mannered. They will never come out until their parents call them. And when they call them, they come out to say hello and go back. They'll never sit 
unless they are told by parents. Now, to me, this is discipline. Discipline. For the Western world, they're going to say this is dictatorship. Let the child breathe. Shut up. I know what is good for my child. They need to learn who is old and who is young, who is big and who is small. They need to understand that when they talk to their uncles, to someone who is older than them, they better talk and their head down to the ground. They need to respect the elders. Life is not chaos. And what is the East being seen as people who are old-fashioned, they're behind. And their way of thinking, they're behind. Sorry. Well, when somebody has the fear of the Lord to the world, he is behind. He is an old-fashioned. They want someone to be modern, stylish, goes with the flow. No, my dear friend. My advice to everyone who came from the East and Eastern way of living, those who came from the East to the West, I'll give you an advice. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever lose track of your heritage. Be proud of it. If you are from Syria, be proud of it. If you are from Lebanon, be proud of it. If you are from Italy, be proud of it. If you are from Egypt, be proud of it. If you are from the Sudan, be proud of it. If you are from Iraq, be proud of it. Wherever you're from, be proud of that heritage. But what you need to do, and if you are from Iran, be proud of it. Whatever heritage you have, hold on to it and respect it and honor it. But what do you do? Take the good values of the East and the good values of the West and integrate the two together. Some people go wrong. They come from the East and they want to bring the East to the West and live the Eastern way. It never works. It won't work. So they want to be Easterners in the West. Doesn't work, brother. Oi, 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 oi. Doesn't work. It's off tune. Some people come from the East, they want to live the West, dissolve totally. And when they speak English, it is so broken, just get a life. You're not an Aussie. So stop pretending you're an Aussie. You came from the East, say where you're from, but thank Australia as well. Take the values of the East and the values of the West. Don't take everything from the West because there are things in the West are against the Almighty God. And the biggest thing the Western world will give you that is offensive to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, one thing, the West will teach you on to live in an autonomous culture, period. It is you and you only. They teach you to be your own God. You do as you please. You're a youngster, you want to leave home, get out, the government will help you find a place and they'll pay you for it. Shame on such governments. Shame. A government has no authority, no jurisdiction to tell me how to live. They're there to protect my values, but not to dictate on how to live. You know, when, when it was during lockdown, right? What a nonsense. The health people, I don't know who they were, and I don't want to know honestly, but I pray for them. They said, we're going to go to schools, and ask an 11 or 12 year old child, is it okay for you to receive the injection or not? 
If that 12 year old says yes, we don't need the parents consent. A 12 year old, I'm, I'm still gonna give him milk in a dummy. They're still babies, for God's sake. You inject little child, what do they know of life? Even if you're 16, what do you know of life? Even if you're 18, what do you know of life? Even if you're 20, 21, 24, what do you know? Life is so deep. Life is so precious. Life is so purposeful and meaningful because God created it and gave it. What do you know of life? For you to make a judgment at a very infancy stage. But the Western world teaches you on how to live an individualistic lifestyle. The Eastern world teaches you on how to live a family lifestyle. Even when you are from Malta, Kefenti, Taiba. Go Malta and St. Paul. Yes, uh, Mr. Borg. <laughs> Mr. Borg is a very famous name. Everybody is Borg. And Tony. <laughs> we need to integrate what my parents taught me. I'll never lose track of that. Respect those who are older. Know your, your limitations. And when you come to the West, learn the good values. One thing good about the West that I don't like about the East, we have to be fair. The Eastern culture, the problem with it, because it's based on va family values, they took this as a mean and as a way, as an advantage, to sticky beak their noses where it doesn't belong. Middle Eastern people, they need to know what you did this morning, what you ate, where you went, where you came. They look from the windows when you leave home, where you go, they are, they surpass FBI, CIA, KGB, BBC, KFC. They surpass all of them. Habib Albi, what's it to you what my neighbor is doing? Stick to your own life. Western world <coughs> teaches you on to mind your own business. Beautiful. Beautiful. I carry my family value and I mind my own business in my own family, not next door's family. That's integration. The Lord struggles because of love. He wants us to come and be submissive to Him willingly, not forcefully. But when the time comes to do His will, whether you like it or not, He will bring that head down to the ground. He will. Trust me, He will. Oh, you can't win with the Lord Jesus. You go against him, you, ha you must fall. I've tried it. <laughs> I don't just talk, I've lived it. I was going to be ordained a priest. That's a confessional session. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. At some stage I won it, didn't happen. A few years later, it was given to me, offered to me. I didn't want it after a few years. I changed my mind. I ran away. Two months. Two months of struggle. And I was saying it to him in his face. Find someone else. I don't want it. Now, whether you want to believe it or not, it's up to you. I'm not saying for you to believe or not. I'm just letting you, I'm just saying what I've lived. I, I said to the Lord, I said, I want, find someone else. As a priest, not as a bishop. <laughs> so imagine if I didn't want to be a priest, definitely I didn't want to be a bishop, right? <laughs> 
So I didn't want to be a priest. And I said, find someone else. I'm not worthy of it. I don't want it. Please, Lord. Plenty of beautiful men out there. Find someone else. After the two months, he came. Not in a dream. Not in a... No, 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 no. He spoke. He said, listen, stop fighting against me and stop running away. Do you think you can run away from me? I have you by the neck by my right hand. I've grabbed your neck with my right hand. Where do you think you're going? You cannot run. So, let go and let my will be done. The moment I said, yes, Lord. <laughs> it was very calm and peaceful. No more struggles. Because the Lord knows what he has chosen for you. My beloved, Jesus Christ has got nothing to do with anyone coming and claiming to be a Christian. For God's sake, he is God. So we need to acknowledge this first. Just because you're a Christian, that doesn't make you a friend of Jesus. Or that doesn't make you that you know Jesus. There are so many Christians that are total strangers to Christ. Because Christ is not received just because I'm a Christian. Christ is lived when you give in to his will and allow him to mold you and shape you and form you, you need to let Jesus work in you freely. Then you'll realize who Jesus Christ is. Just by coming to church doesn't mean that you are now the closest person to Jesus. No. Just by reading the Bible doesn't mean now that you are the saint of all saints. No. You need to live Christ. And to live Christ, it means one thing. You do not whinge, you do not complain if he pays you a denarii or he pays you nothing. Why do we get offended? Because I got hurt. I worked all my life in the church and at the end they kicked me out. I will never accept this. I will never let them get away with it. But why are you getting upset? Jesus brought you. Jesus made you work in his house. Whatever happens to you, Jesus allows it. Why are you upset? Uh, because I'm working in his house, but I'm working my way, not his way. Even in the church, we want to do it our way, not his. That's why the church is in division and in turmoil, because everyone wants to have the biggest throne The more God gives you, the more you humble yourself and say, I have nothing. Everything is God's. The more God exalts you, the more you lower yourself and say, I am nothing. Everything is God's. Because everything is God's and from God. So when we say we're nothing, we're just stating the truth, a fact. When somebody's been working all their life in the church, and someone comes at the last hour, just today, and walks in and receives the same reward as the person who's been working all their life, why should you be upset that this new person who just walked in from the front door receives the same respect and the same, 
welcoming as I have been all these years. No, they shouldn't be. No, the Lord wants to reward the last person like the first person. What's it to you, my friend? Is it your house? No. Is it your rank? No. Is it your throne? No. Is it your cross? No. Is it your crown? No. So what is the big deal that you're trying to make? Nothing is yours, everything is the Lord's, and the Lord is free to do with what he has in whichever way he chooses to. He is free. Why do we get upset? Why do we get offended? Bishop, you spoke to this person, you didn't speak to me. Bishop, you visited this person, but you didn't visit me. That's not right. I've been working with you, Bishop, for years. This guy came the other day. How come you're talking to this guy and not me? Maybe the Lord wants me to talk to this guy, not you. What's it to you? <laughs> you know why we whinge and complain? We haven't lived humility as yet. There is still the old me trying to be a show-off, trying to conquer. Just get rid of you and let Christ be you. I built the church and nobody called my name on the pulpit. I donated a hundred thousand dollars and nobody mentioned nothing of it. So what do we do now for people to donate? My friend, we're going to make a nice plaque with your name and the family and we'll stick it on the pew. This pew has been purchased by such and such family. The chandelier, we will engrave your name. The chandelier will stay here for the rest of your life. You will never be forgotten. No, my dear friend, when you go to the pit, you'll be forgotten. Don't worry about the chandelier. And the chandelier is going to rust and die and the lights are going to go off. And there will be no more bunnings to give you lights. We'll put your name in the brick of the church building. Aren't you blessed? Your name is gone in the building of the house of the Lord. Run away from such boastful statements. Very dangerous. You know what? You have received your reward from people, nothing from God. When people applaud you, when people acknowledge what you've done, the Lord what he said 2,000 years ago will apply to you. The Lord said, you've received your reward from people. You've got nothing with me. Nothing from me. You didn't wait for my reward. You waited for people to reward you. Because you wanted your name to be mentioned. You wanted to be applauded for it. You wanted to be recognized and glorified before the whole world then what are you expecting from jesus christ of nazareth haven't you learned that your lord works in secrecy so when someone like me comes to you and says can you donate to the church but you know what i'll do in return i'll put a shrine in your name and I'll put the statue of the Holy Mother and an icon of the Lord Jesus and, I'll, and people will come and light candles. This is all in your name. Run away from such a bishop. Run away. Say, Lord, when I come and donate in your house, I need to say the following before I donate anything. Lord, I thank you for me the unworthy servant the sinner of all sinners to allow me to come and give something to your house this is the greatest blessings and honor from you lord thank you for letting me donate to that box that is sitting outside of this church i'm extremely blessed 
And whatever I'm going to put there, I took it from your hand and gave it back to your hand. The money is yours. The clothes are yours. The house is yours. The car, everything is yours. This body, this spirit, this soul, it is all the work of your hand. You made everything. Everything is yours, Lord. So whatever I do, I am the useless servant. I've done nothing out of my own goodness. It is the good God who allowed me to do good. Don't expect a reward and a wage from the Lord Jesus and whinge when he pays you and when he rewards you. Let him do it his way, not your way. I'll tell you this true story. I've, I've mentioned it before, maybe some of you haven't heard it. Anyway, Arnold Palmer, an Aussie born, lived in America most of his life and at his peak, he was the most famous golf player in the world. He was Australian by birth, lived most of his life in America and he was extremely famous at the game of golf. One day in Saudi Arabia, this is a true story, in Saudi Arabia, the king of Saudi Arabia, oh, the rich people, babe, I must probably give him a call. <laughs> Hello, king. Just like Mr. Trump. He said, I like the king. One day I called him, I said, hey, king, you need to give me money. I give you protection, you need to give me money. I like the way he talks, you know, one of these cowboys. You know. So I'm going to call the king, say, hey, king, give me some money. <laughs> no, I don't need your money, brother. I've got the money of the king of kings. So the king of Saudi Arabia decided to build a golf course in the middle of their desert, which is all sand. Nothing grows in sand. So they made an oasis out of this sandy desert. The king decided for the opening ceremony of this magnificent golf course, he decided to invite all the celebrities, all the big golf players from all over the world. One of them happened to be Arnold Palmer. So he said we went and we had the big opening day. We started playing golf at the expense of the king of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. And in the evening, we were all invited to the palace. The king came after we had dinner. He started mingling in the midst of all the golf players and he came to me, I, Arnold Palmer, and he shook my hand and he said, how are you? And how do you find the golf course in Saudi Arabia? He said, King, it's absolutely beautiful. And then he said, he put me on the spot. Unexpectedly, he asked me this, what can I do for you? He said, the king now asked me, what do you want from me? I wasn't expecting that at all. He said, I became so nervous. What do I say? In a split second, he said, King, I want a club. He said, done. He went back to America. He said, one week went by, I checked the mailbox, there was nothing. Second week, third week, I said, come on, Arnold, do you think the king has got nothing else to do but to think of you and of your club? He has forgotten about you. He's got a million things on his plate. He said, one day after I had forgotten about the whole matter, I come, I check the mailbox, there's a big letter, an envelope, sorry, sealed, written on it, confidential. I look at the address, the king of Saudi Arabia. I run inside the house and try to open it as quick as possible. I open the envelope. I pull out this piece of paper called a title deed to 500 acre golf club. You see, when Arnold Palmer asked, said to the king of Saudi Arabia, I want a club, in his thinking he meant a golf stick. Because my beloved, if you're not aware of the game, golf club can refer to the entire property and a golf club can refer to a little stick. So Arnold, in his thought, he meant the stick. 
But the king in his thought, he interpreted as the club. Why? Because what Arnold can afford is a stick, but what the king can afford is the entire 500 acre club. You see, everyone gives according to what they are capable of. Don't say to the Lord, I want this. Let him reward you because he will reward you not as a king, but as the king of all kings. If the king of Saudi Arabia interpreted the club as the property, how much more can Jesus Christ, the king of all kings, give you when you ask of him? Oh, the ultimate thing you ask, say, Lord, I want nothing from you. I want you. Hello, Habibi. <laughs> now you're talking, baby. I want you, Lord. I don't want your kingdom. <laughs> it's too big to fit it in my garage. <laughs> I don't drive a kingdom. Right? So I don't want your kingdom. I don't want no money. I don't want nothing. I want you. You. Now this is wisdom. When, I, when you give me you, you can take me now anywhere, to hell, to paradise, up, down, inside, out. You put me on a throne, you put me in the street, matters not as long as I have you. Now that is true love. And this is a true spirit of a servant in the house of the Lord. God bless you. Um, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to forgive us our sins. Allow us to come forward and make us worthy to receive him in the true body and blood of Christ, the Savior and the Redeemer of the world. Amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all, pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants, and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit, by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the walks of their behavior and the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will, to confess, worship, and praise your, ho your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. This sermon encourages us to accept God's unconditional love and forgiveness. Rejoice in God's grace, knowing it is freely given. Trust in God's timing and purpose for our lives. Humble ourselves and acknowledge God as the rightful ruler of our lives. Seek to live in unity, respecting both Eastern and Western cultures.